Well, again, Brother Jim is not with us here this morning. Uh, like he said, Brother Lloyd, I'm going to be there. But uh, that's okay. We're, uh, we're going to pray for him. We're going to put Jim on the bottom of that prayer list there. And uh, we have a number of others. Well, actually, Brother Jim and Sister Sandy are already on the prayer list up there at the top. I forgot about that. But on that list, the prayer list there, uh, Brother Jim and Sandy, I remember Brother Gary and his health, Sister Rosie and her family, Brother Randy and Sister Barb, uh, Marlene fell and hurt her shoulder, but hello, Sister Marlene. We're glad to have you back with us. By the way, I understand that shoulder thing. I didn't fall on mine, but we're having sympathetic pains uh, with, with yours. This, this thing about getting old, you know, they used to they used to tell us that we were going to have golden years and it was going to be great and fun and what a bunch of liars. But at any rate, I remember Brother Gene and uh, his health needs. Uh, Brother Charlie and his. Remember Charlie's new foot? It'll start working right. <clears throat> Is it working right yet? So far. Okay. Well, work better right. I have a problem with it yet. Okay. Remember Brother Jane, Sister Jane, uh, of course, they lost their house to fire. Um, I did get a chance to go up there. Uh, they do have their new double blind in place. It is a very nice double blind. Uh, Sister Jane was a little bit unhappy. Uh, I'm not sure what you can do about it, but there were several places where you walk through and it's squeak, 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 squeak. And uh, she was not at all happy with that. I told her, I said, that's exactly what you need, though. In case a burglar comes in at night, you hear the squeak, squeak, and you know there's somebody in there. She, she didn't take it all that well, but that's okay. Remember Brother James and Sister Jane. Uh, Sister Ali and Dorothy need our prayers. Uh, Sister Nina Williams needs our prayers. Uh, Sister Julie and her health. Uh, Dave Swindler uh, about his full recovery. Uh, I'd love to see Brother Dave back here in church. Uh, Brother Larry and Sister Lee Faust, Brother Chuck's friend Scott Hackenberg, Brett and Amanda having marriage problems, uh, Sister Jenny Whip recovering from a car accident, Sister Lori was over there last night, and uh, after all of the surgery and the pain and the rehab and everything, Sister Jenny was standing up walking without a cane, without a crutch, without a walker. Uh, I'm not sure that she was ready to do a five mile march, but uh, she was up, standing up, and able to get around. You know, there's only one answer to that. That is prayer. And we just say, thank you, Lord. Uh, you know, that, that's all we can do there. Uh, remember Brother Red's family? Uh, Red Parks, stage four cancer, needs our prayers. Uh, Sister Barbara Bird, having spinal surgery, March 31st. That'll be Wednesday. Uh, good Lord willing, if nothing goes wrong. Remember her and her son. Fell and broke his hip. I remember him in prayer. How's Johnny doing, Brother Bob? He's doing pretty good. Good. Got any idea when he's going to get out of that place, that jail house down there? Uh, I think he's going to stay in that house with him. Oh, you mean the nursing home? Yeah. I don't know. I haven't told him that. Okay. <laughs> he's in the nursing home getting rehab, I guess that's what we call it. Uh, remember that. Anybody else have a perfect question you want to share with us this morning? <coughs> yeah, so I, I go in and train uh, you to what the hell I guess I'm not part of my national health. Anyone else? Remember my son Andy? I was over there the other day and he was going through something and he's just really miserable. And of course he can't tell us, but you can tell there's something wrong. And they said this has been going on for a little while. Okay. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Pray for the Laner family. Laner? In Delaware, the ones that sell pumpkins. Yeah. The wife left to take her kids to school, came back, and her husband committed suicide. Oh, oh my God. And he's only 43 years old. Yeah. And from what I've been told, it's like she had no clue. They usually don't. Yeah. That's the sad part about suicide. It is a thing that 
people who get to the point they don't see any point in going on, and they've already gotten to the point to where they don't see any point in telling anybody uh, that they, most people who survive the attempt, when people talk to them, will tell you that they got to the point where there was no sense, they didn't feel there was even any sense of talking to someone about it. And that's the sad part. You know, if he had, if he had called any one of us, hey, you know, Linda, I don't know you from nobody, but I'm thinking about committing suicide. Can you help me? Yeah, Linda would have been down there or called somebody or something. Uh, suicide is a serious, sad thing. But yes, you will remember that. Anybody else? Yeah, Linda Julie, she's having some tests. Yeah. Please, down to OSU. Anyone else? I can't, can't praise God for everything, but that storm last week tore the doors off my shop, and let's uh, see, one of the lights oh, went out in the house, and My shoulders just don't let me work anymore. Okay. Anybody else? If all hearts and minds are clear, or if you want to stand and ask God's blessing on his prayer request, we will start. Thank you, Lord, for everything you do for us and all the prayers you've answered. And we come again, Lord, more to request. We know you're more than able to take care of each and every one. So we thank you. Well, this is your part of the service uh, where everybody gets a chance to stand up and God's been good to me today if something happened that I don't understand I'd like to talk about or I want to praise God, I want to lift up his name it's your part of the service who wants to be first this morning? During my devotions this morning I had a song that I don't do it very well but I would like to say it for you Bless the name of Jesus, praise the name of Jesus, sing unto the King of Israel. Bless the name of Jesus, praise the name of Jesus, sing unto the King of Israel. I sing glory, glory, glory to his name forever. Glory, glory.
made the statement that uh, I can't teach you to praise and worship. And for what I taught you or spoke to you about last night or last week and tried to help you with, if it were to be taken as an, uh, an amount of praise and worship that I taught you, it would be like a teaspoon or a small teacup full of the water that would fill this building. I, I can't teach you that much about praise and worship. Because in the first place, praise has to come from you. I can't say, Pam, praise the Lord. Well, she can raise her hand and say, praise the Lord. But the full praise of the Lord from Pam has to come from Pam. And it has to be down in Pam that Pam starts. That is where praise comes from. And worship does the same thing. And again, we, we said last week that the single most important way we can worship Almighty God is to be the person He would have us to be. We are His children. And to emulate Him, to emulate Jesus Christ, to try our very best to be the very best child of God that we can be is the single most important thing, the most important way of worship. But we talked about that last week and about how important it is to first pray and then praise and then worship God. And we can praise the Lord in our prayer. In fact, actually going to Him in prayer is in itself a praise. Um, yeah, Charlie said, which he did earlier today, I um, remember him in having the cancer taken off of his face. In praying that, he's asking us to ask God to help him out, realizing that God can help him out, and having faith in God to help him out. So when we pray, that is a form of praise to Almighty God. And, of course, uh, Jesus taught us to pray, uh, which when we do pray, we emulate Jesus, and again, we worship God by being a better child of God at that particular moment in time. But uh, the statement of praise and worship brings us to the purpose to recall exactly what today, Palm Sunday, is all about. Um, but a little background before we get to Palm Sunday. Uh, the background is important to know why. There are a lot of things that we do that sometimes we don't know the why behind it. Um, if I ask Brother Bob, can you explain all of the electronic wizardry when you push that button on your car that starts it? Can you explain it? Yeah. Doesn't make any difference that he knows what's going on. He knows that it works. That's the important part. Uh, but sometimes having a little bit of a background in it, uh, for example, if I had, well, I don't know if I could do Chuck's uh, uh, little red car out there in the garage. I don't know if I could, I could do the ignition on that one. But you take me back to a 55 Chevy or 56 Ford, something like that, I can do that ignition. I can do that electronics. Well, it wasn't any electronics. I can do that electric work. Uh, I know enough about it. Uh, and it's important to know that so that you can make things work. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to kind of look into the ignition, so to speak, of the uh, Palm Sunday. A little background. Uh, first off, it was the Jewish equivalent of what we call Monday. Sunday to the Jew is the first day of the week. How many of you here loves Mondays? Quick, all hands up. <laughs> Daniel, did you notice that the hands that went up, everybody was retired? <laughs> <laughs> Every last one of them. Yes, sir, buddy. His hand didn't go up. He's still working. Danny's hand didn't go up. He's still working. Adrian's hand, I didn't see, so I can't tell for sure if her hand went up or not. But I don't think she was too tickled pink with money. Most people aren't. There's all kinds of things out there. People talk about uh, Blue Monday. Uh. But to the Jew, in Jesus' day, Sunday was their equivalent of Monday. It was the first day of the week. It was the first day of their 
work week. And by the way, uh, if you don't have anything else, you know, if you're sitting along some sitting along some day and sitting in your house having your own personal little pity party, and you can't find anything to praise God about, I mean, let me share something with you. The rest of the world, and we're talking like 90% of the rest of the world, they are lucky to have one day off in a week's time. If they're Jewish or if they're Muslim, it's Saturday, the seventh day of the week. In the United States, uh, portions of England, France, and Western Europe, Canada, Australia, uh, we have two days. And the reason we have two days is because we have a large Jewish population that needs Saturday for their Sabbath, and we have a large Christian population who needs Sunday for their Sabbath. So the people in both all sorts of those governments decided, hey, this is cool. Let's give them two days off. If we give them two days off, we get two days off too. So that's what that's all about. And, and seriously, you know, to stop and think, 80, 90 percent of the rest of the world, they're lucky to get one day off. We get two. And in a, in a normal work week, I know there's, there's a lot of people who work oddball hours and oddball days. Daniel is one of them. Uh, but he, the weekend is still there, and at times when they're working his schedule, they look at it, oh yeah, well, let's give, let's give him the weekend off. What's that, two a year or three you get? We laugh about it sometimes, but it's no big deal. It is something that you can praise God about. Blessed to be here in the United States. Blessed to be a part of Western civilization that does recognize the Jewish Sabbath, does recognize the Christian Sabbath, and gives both the opportunity to practice their worship. But this is a, this particular day, back when Jesus was getting ready for what we call Palm Sunday, it was a very special Monday to them. And excuse the analogy, I was trying to come up with a good analogy, how do I describe this to everybody? The nearest analogy is Palm Sunday to them would be what we call Black Friday. They were getting ready to go shopping. The most important shopping day of the entire year for the Jew was the 10th day of Nisan. The 10th day of Nisan was when they would go out uh, to the marketplace uh, the downtown marketplace, perhaps if they lived on the outskirts of town, there was a suburban marketplace, or they may even have gone outside the city and found the shepherd. And at the shepherd, they would have looked for a lamb. They would have bought a lamb that to look at the lamb, it was perfect on the outside. Now, there may have been something on the inside, but you couldn't see that. The perfect on the outside it couldn't be blind, it couldn't be lame, it couldn't have a missing ear, uh, you know, none of those things. It had to be perfect. But uh, they started their new year on the 10th day of the first month. That first month was started on the first day of the new moon after the spring equinox. I know that's a lot of words there, but that's the way it was done. They actually had people go out of the city, go up on the hill trying to get away from any light pollution. They would have four or five or six runners out there sitting up on the hill, and they would look up into the sky, trying to see that very first little glimmer of a piece of the moon that would start that month. That would be the thing that they were looking for. And if they found it, Sister Linda, it was a foot race to get back into town to tell the high priest, we've got the new moon, we've got the new day, we've got the new month, we've got the new year. And they were there, the religious year would start on that day. That would be the first day of the month Nisan. God had told Moses to tell the people that this is a holiday I want you to continue forever. And believe it or not, Passover is still continuing. Um, I have a nephew and his wife. Uh, they are, I uh, can't think of the right word. 
At any rate, they are Christians, but they follow all of the uh, holidays and so forth of the Old Testament. And Passover is one of the things that they do. Uh, they have uh, a standard Passover, just like the Jewish Passover. But God had told Moses to tell the people to continue this Passover forever. Jews still do it. Uh, it's something that they, they did forget for several years back in their history. Uh, they didn't have it because of wars and whatsoever, some other things. But as far as can be determined in history. Uh, there pretty much has been at least a Passover celebrated by some Jew ever since uh, Moses instituted the first Passover in Egypt when he told them to take a lamb, slay the lamb, go to the doorpost and to the lintel, put the blood on the doorpost, put the blood on the lintel, and when the death angel comes through the night, he will pass over you. That was what Passover got started with. Moving up to Jesus' day, this was the 10th day of Nisan. God had told Moses to tell the people, on the 10th day you go out, you select a lamb. You bring the lamb in, and for four days, you keep it up, you feed it, you take care of it, and so forth. And on the 14th day of Nisan, we think of 14th day being daytime, you have to remember, the Jews' day starts at sundown. Our day starts at midnight. Theirs starts at this time of year about 6 to 6.30 is their sundown. So sundown, if this were the 10th of Nisan, which it isn't, but if it were, today were the 10th of Nisan, when the sun hits that horizon on the west side, you watch it, and just as that last glimmer of sunlight goes behind the western trees or whatever is at your property, that is the beginning of the new day. The tenth day of Nisan, they would have selected, they would have gone out into town, they would have purchased this land. And one of the things that is often lost in the story of Palm Sunday, we have to go back to Christmas. These are the lambs being sold in the marketplace that the shepherds were in the field watching over the night Jesus was born. These lambs were the ones that were sold that three months after Jesus was born, there in the late wintertime, these were the lambs that were sold for Passover lambs. That's what that was all about. That's the connection to Christmas and Passover there. But um, they went out to buy that lamb, and not only did they buy the lamb, but they also, like Black Friday, how many goes Black Friday shopping for Christmas gifts? Oh, come on. Nobody but me? Okay, I put both hands up. There's always somebody somewhere selling something that I'm going to go look at. I might not buy it. But Brother Danny, I'm going to go look at it. Because they tell me they've got a 75% off sale. I'm going to go look at that. I don't know what you can sell for 25% of what it's supposed to be. But I, I got to go look at it anyway. You know what I mean? And if nothing else, there's a lot of places you get a free cup of coffee and whatever else. And it's one of the last few days. Uh, I didn't go. I don't think I went last year. I think because of COVID and everything, I think we stayed home or something. But uh, I have enjoyed going on that day. But again, this particular 10th of Nissan would have been a Monday, the first day of the week. Well, Sunday, but the first day of the week for them would have been a Monday. And it was a semi-holiday. They did have to do their work. Don't get me wrong. They, they had jobs to do. They had work to do. But everybody realized what it was. And I'm sure that a lot of the shops closed down early so that the people could get out, get out and get their lamb. They had to get that lamb before Sunday. So, you know, they had to get out and get it done. Maybe the wife had to go get it or maybe one of the kids. But they took hard cash money to go out and buy these lambs. And uh, again, Passover was to them very similar to what we think of as Christmas. Uh, they bought little gifts, especially for the uh, 
children. One of the things that you do in Passover is you search the house for anything that might have yeast in it. You can't have anything in the house that has any yeast in it. You have to get rid of all yeast, all yeast bread, all the biscuits. Uh, you bake your cornbread without yeast, so you can eat it. But you know what? You understand what I'm saying? And the whole house, everybody, the, the kids would go through the house, and if they found something, which the parents would sometimes hide, they would hide a cookie or a piece of bread or something like that, and the kids would find it, and of course they're getting rid of the yeast and so forth, and they would give the child a little gift uh, for doing this. But that would be on Tuesday and Wednesday uh, before Passover would be on Thursday. But they would keep the little lamb up and uh, get it ready to be literally butchered on after sundown on the 14th, which in our, if you, if you work it up in the week, uh, Sunday is the 10th, Monday's the 11th, uh, Tuesday's the 12th, Wednesday's the 13th, but at 6 o'clock on Wednesday night, or sundown, Wednesday night, begins the 14th day of Nisan. The 14th day of Nisan was passed over. That was when they slaughtered the little lamb, skinned the little lamb, cleaned him and everything, and literally roasted the lamb over an open fire. Uh, that's what was done. Now, Bob and Barbara have all the two of them. So, how big a lamb do they need? Just the two of them. What Barb and Bob would have done would have invited half of us to come down there so that we could all have Passover together or something like that. Uh, the idea was that none of it could be left over. It all had to be eaten. And in those days and times, you have to understand that food was at a premium. No food was wasted, if it was at all possible. But God had also told Moses that if there is any left over, it has to be burned. You don't take no leftover and put it in the fridge. Of course, you didn't have fridges, but you understand what I'm saying? It wasn't, it wasn't kept. So they would gather their family together, maybe some neighbors, maybe some friends. Uh, they would have bought a 25 or 20 pound lamb once it's butchered. There would be 11 or 12 pounds of meat there, uh, 11 or 12 pounds of lamb, uh, two or three pounds of bones. So you've got nine pounds of meat that you can spread out, share, about half a pound each, that's 18 people, that's a pretty good size group of people, and having Passover together. But that was the, the, the concept. Uh, and there were a number of prophecies in the Old Testament that connected Jesus Christ to the Passover lamb. Um, as him being both the Messiah and being the Lamb of God. But the single most important prophecy about Jesus being the sacrificial Passover Lamb actually doesn't come from the Old Testament. It comes from John the Baptist. In the New Testament, John the Baptist had been preaching down along the Jordan River. He had been preaching that there was one coming after him the latchet of whose shoes he was unworthy to stoop and unloose. In other words, he was not worthy to help Jesus take off his shoes and sit down and rest his feet. He didn't feel he was worthy to do that. But John, when he saw Jesus coming, this is when he said this right here. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Would you bow your heads with me? Our precious and most kind Heavenly Father, <laughs> thank you, Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, who taketh away the sin of the world. Thank you, Father, for John the Baptist, who, <laughs> though there were those that uh, wanted to argue with him and wanted to get after him and so forth. He never let it bother him at all. 
He spoke boldly. He preached boldly. And as Jesus came down, he made this bold statement. A statement that, for the most part, most of the people probably would not remember, but some would because of the greatness and the boldness of what he said. And we thank you, Father, for both John and for Jesus. And we thank you, Father, for the sacrifice four days later after this 10th of Nisan that Jesus would make for us as our one and only Passover lamb. We thank you, Father. Guide us and direct us in our understanding when you give the praise in Jesus' name. And they all said, Amen. Amen. Again, John had long preached there was one coming after him. The last set of loose shoes. Uh, he was not worthy to stoop and unloose. Uh, John said, I do indeed baptize you with water, but huh, the one that's coming after me, he will baptize you with fire and with the Holy Ghost. A lot of people uh, misunderstand that statement there. He will baptize you with fire and with the Holy Ghost. If you stop and think about it, there's only two possibilities John offered. One was fire, one was the Holy Ghost. And if you die, there are only two possibilities in the place that you wind up eternally. One is with fire, one is with the Holy Ghost. So guess what John was talking about? Yes, sir. Y'all need to get saved. But uh, he used the term, Behold the Lamb of God. Um, I tried my best to come up with some kind of an analogy and Daniel won't remember this uh, Gary and Gary Jr. won't uh, maybe some of the rest of you won't but uh, when John F. Kennedy came home from World War II it was Lieutenant John F. Kennedy one of the Kennedy family uh, the second son the eldest son had volunteered for a suicide mission uh, going into France with a bomber loaded with uh, very fragile bombs and over the English Channel the bomber blew up. Jack was killed. When Jack Kennedy was killed, John Kennedy, the next one in line, became the next one in line for his father to do the best he could to groom him. And his father helped, I won't say that he didn't, because he certainly did. But it was what John F. Kennedy did himself that made the difference. And there were people all over, uh, up around Massachusetts, New York, New Jersey, Washington, D.C., that saw this John F. Kennedy, and they said, one day, that man is going to be something. And uh, I'll tell you the truth. The next day when I found out that John F. Kennedy had beat Richard Nixon for the presidency, I sure wasn't happy. <laughs> I, had, I had wanted it to go the other way. But in years later, I found out the kind of man that John Kennedy was. And I certainly hope, Brother Bob, I meet him in heaven. I hope the man is there. I want to shake his hand. But he was talked about in the way that people would say, this man is going to be something. Uh, this man is going to do great things. In this statement that John made about Jesus, behold the Lamb of God, it was the same type of phraseology, if you will. This man is important. This man has a special destiny. This man is going to do something. He is connected with, and the connection when he said the Lamb of God, the connection is the Passover lamb, which everyone, of course, in Israel, uh, you know, we don't think about any of our ancestors putting blood on the doorpost and on the metal and the death angel going across them, because that's not a part of our personal history in the years, the close years past. But it was theirs. It was a part of their uh, growing up their teaching, their history, everybody understood this phraseology, behold the Lamb of God. And uh, it was well known to the Israelis. Uh, it was used in connection with the Lamb of the Passover and the blood on the doorposts and so forth. Um, 
the blood on the doorpost saved them that night. Uh, if you remember the story, the death angel came into Egypt, and the firstborn of everything, the firstborn <coughs> of the sheep, the firstborn of the dogs, the firstborn of the cats, the firstborn of uh, the donkeys, the mules, the horses, and of course the firstborn of every family in Egypt died. And one of the things I've often wondered is, why didn't Pharaoh die? Well, obviously he wasn't the firstborn, but his oldest son died. And uh, the Bible makes it plain that he certainly was not happy to lose his child. But the blood on the doorpost and the blood on the lintel from the Passover lamb saved the nation of Israel, the firstborn of the nation of Israel, all through that Passover night. And no one, <clears throat> no one at all has ever tried to make a connection to where John the Baptist, when he said this, had some kind of a vision to see Jesus hanging on the cross three years later. Uh, there never was that. It was simply God bringing out a message. And that message, that day and that time, for those people, some of them would remember. Some of them would remember, I was down on the creek bank one day when John the Baptist saw this guy, uh, Jesus was his name. He called him the Lamb of God. Now, Linda, why do you suppose he said that? And the conversation would go. Bob, do you have any understanding of why John would have said that? And we would have had a conversation. And then maybe Linda and Bob later would have had a conversation. It started that conversation that continued all through Jesus' uh, ministry. Uh, a few minutes later, John takes Jesus down, baptizes him, and then the dove lights on his shoulder. Another prophecy that a dove would come <clears throat> to mark the Messiah. And these people knew these things. How many of you here have read a book or read a funny book or Listen to something on television about the end times. You know, all of us have in one way or another. Uh, we, we've done something, we've looked at something, we understand, we understand something about the end times. The end times for the Israelites in Jesus' day was not the end times as the end of the world. Their end time thought pattern was the Messiah coming. When he comes, and there were priests that were teaching when the Messiah comes, he's going to kill every one of these Romans. He's going to set the rule back up like it should be. And Israel's going to be free all over again. Well, you all have watched television. You've seen preachers on there that have preached garbage. Well, there was priests preaching garbage back then, too. Uh, but there, were, there was an understanding that there would be a Messiah. When the Messiah came, he would set things straight. There was not an absolute 100% understanding of what set things straight meant. But they were looking for the Messiah. And uh, to a certain extent, we're looking for the mark of the beast. We're looking for the building of the temple in Jerusalem. We're looking for some of the things that are come, going to come to pass one of these days. Uh, there was a bunch of garbage went around. Some of you may have seen it on Facebook or Twitter or someplace. They were saying that the COVID shot is the mark of the beast. And if you take it, you get out of here. <laughs> you know, the mark of the beast is going to be in the right hand or in the forehead. I'm not going to ask you how many of you got your shots. But if you did, how many of you got it in the right hand or the forehead? Right. And see? Yeah. Back then, people were told wrong. Today, people are being told wrong. But they were uh, looking for the Messiah. And what John the Baptist gave them was some prophetic words for the people then. And the people who heard that, some of them would remember that. Uh, I don't know about you, if, if any one of you here, or maybe all of you, 
might be able to look back a year, two years, three years, five years. You remember a special message that I taught up here, or you remember a special uh, song that we sang, or a special message that maybe Brother Dorsal preached here, or something. You remember something special because it did something in your mind. It, it piqued some interest somehow. Well, that was what God was doing with John the Baptist. He was starting to pique that interest by giving John the prophecy that this is, this actually is the Lamb of God. This is the Messiah in the flesh, if you will. And uh, John, by using the term Lamb of God, began the connection of the Passover Lamb. And uh, began to get them to understand that you needed that shed blood to be saved. You needed that shed blood to be spared. You needed that shed blood to be saved. I guess that would be the best word to use there. And there was another prophecy uh, that was even a little bit, uh, shall we say, more important to connect Jesus to the Messiah. And that prophecy didn't start back when Jesus was being baptized. That prophecy is the one that we're talking about today. That prophecy is from Zechariah. Zechariah said, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Just real quick, a couple things in there to look at. Zechariah wrote this 550 years before the event occurred. Give or take 10 years. You know, a lot of times those years are a little bit musty and we can't predict them exactly. It was over 500 years, it was less than 600 years. But you know, it's pretty tough looking out there 500 years from now saying, you know, this thing's going to happen. Unless, Brother Larry, Almighty God, woke you up in the middle of the night and said, tell the people this is going to happen. God woke Zechariah up or set him down in the middle of the day. I'm not sure how that happened. But God did get a hold of Zechariah. Uh, Zechariah is uh, part of what they call the minor prophets. I never figured out how one prophet could be minor and one prophet could be major. I just figured they were all prophets of God, used them all, and I'm glad that he did. I'm glad for this <laughs> prophecy right here. Because this prophecy right here, not only does it say that he is just and having salvation, the people knew what the term salvation meant. It meant the same then that it means today. If you have salvation, what do you have? You have a home in heaven. Your name is on the Lamb's book of life. You have been forgiven of your sins. You are bought by the blood of Jesus. And when you take your last breath here, you're going to take your first breath in Almighty God's heaven. Praise the Lord. They knew what salvation meant. They understood the term salvation. Well, not all of it. Does everybody here know what a Sadducee was? They were the ones who did not believe in eternity, did not believe in angels, did not believe in being born again. That's why they were called sad, you see. And that's not a joke either. That's the absolute truth. That was their calling card. They did not believe that eternity was worth anything. That in fact, they didn't believe there was an eternity. When you die, that's it. We're done. I am so glad it's not that way. But going back to the term salvation, Zechariah told him that he had salvation. That this Messiah who would come riding on an ass and upon the colt, the foal of an ass. The writers of the New Testament, I, I started to look it up last night and I forgot to do it. One of the writers of the New Testament as he was recalling Jesus' description and instructions, Jesus told his disciples to go into the city 
and find an ass and a colt and bring them back. The other two writers, he, they just concentrated on bringing the donkey, the one donkey back that Jesus rode. But the key to it is here, there is an inference of two donkeys, just inferred, it's not stated, just inferred. And when Jesus came into the city, the two donkeys were with him. There was the mother and the young donkey that no one had ever ridden before. Now, uh, Sister Mary's sitting back there in the, in the back place. Uh, I'm going to ask her, if you don't care to stick around after church is over with, just in case somebody would like to ask you, what's the chance of getting on a monkey that's never been ridden and him taking you right down the road just nice like <laughs> You see that grin that's on her face? <laughs> yeah. This donkey was touched by God. I, I don't know any other way to say it. This donkey was touched by God. Jesus Christ, God, they put, the disciples put their clothing on the donkey. Jesus, they, they helped him up on the donkey. And into the town they came. Now, again, this was the 10th of Nisan. This was the preparation day. Uh, they had uh, gotten their lamb or were in the process of getting their lamb. Uh, people were not so much in the workplace as they were out and doing things by the time Jesus came. And lo and behold, coming down off of the Mount of Olives, coming across the brook Kidron, here comes Jesus with his disciples and the two donkeys and him riding on it. And this is the tenth of Nisan. And some of them all of a sudden began to put this whole thing together. They remembered the teaching of John the Baptist, the Lamb of God. They knew this was a tenth of Nisan that a lamb was going to be uh, selected. They knew that this prophecy was that when the Messiah came, he would come with the two donkeys. And as they began to look down there and see this, some of them began to shout, Hosanna, 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 which in the English way of speaking, it's one word that says a whole lot. And the, the, the whole lot that it says is, save us, we pray. That's what Hosanna meant. They recognized the prophecy of Zechariah. They recognized and connected it with the teaching of John the Baptist. They recognized and saw this man that they had heard so much about in the three years that he had healed the blinded eyes of blind Bartimaeus, that he had raised the dead from Jairus' daughter up in Capernaum, they had, that he had healed the centurion servant, that the woman who had the issue of blood for 12 years, he had healed her. He had, he had gone to the tomb where Lazarus stunk. He had been in there so long that his body stunk. But Jesus said, roll the stone back, Lazarus, come out of there! They knew these things. They understood these things. They heard these things. And when they saw him coming into town, riding that donkey, some of them remembered this. You see, they didn't have, um, I don't know, all of these different uh, Yahoo television, uh, YouTube television, and uh, Hulu television, whatever else. They, did, they didn't have all that junk. They didn't have the books and the magazines and the other things to read that we have to take up our time. They didn't have movies. They didn't have places to shop. One of the things that the old Jewish people that they did, they took the time at night to teach their children what they knew. They didn't have a Bible. They didn't have a, a written word of God. But they had what they had been taught in the synagogue that Saturday before. And the parents, especially the father, was responsible to teach his children the law. Teach his children the Torah. And some of them, just like us, we all have favorite things we like to talk about. You, you set me down and you ask me, hey brother boy, what do you know about the end times? Be prepared to sit there because I'll talk to you about it as long as I can or until you get bored and get ready to leave. I really enjoy and love that part. Well, there were parents that did the same thing. They shared what they knew, 
what they heard at the synagogue on Saturday. They shared that through the week. So their children would know. Their children knew these prophecies. Their children knew about this, this man who just seems to be able to do anything. He can raise the dead. He can heal the blinded eyes. He can heal the sick. You know, he, man. And did you, did you hear what he did up there in Galilee? There was, I don't know, four or five thousand people up there. He fed every one of them. Where did he get all that fish and bread from? And you know, he didn't do that once, he did that twice. It's some kind of a miracle. They knew these things. So when Jesus, when Jesus came into the town, there was nothing at all to prevent them from crying, Hosanna, from just shouting, rejoicing, praising the Lord. And then they did something else too. And they saw him coming in. If you read the scripture, it says that some of them took off their coats, took off their cloaks, and laid them in the roadway. They pulled down palm branches and laid them in the roadway. Herod never had that done for him. Pilate never had that done for him. The high priest Caiaphas and, Anna, and Annas, neither one of them had ever had that done for them. That was something that was selected only for the top whoever, if the um, king of Rome had come in, uh, or someone like that. Uh, perhaps the queen of Sheba, if she had come back, you know, the new queen of Sheba, used to be old and came to see Solomon, if a new one had come to see Jesus, they might have done that for her. They gave the greatest civilized, non-religious honor they could to Jesus Christ. It would be similar to uh, Charlie deciding he wants to go to the big Walmart down on Powell Road and the policeman stopping all traffic closing off every road there was down through there and uh, escorting Charlie to Walmart, opening the door for him and saying, where can we point you to so you can find what you're looking for? That's kind of a funny analogy, but that's very similar to what they, what they did for Jesus Christ. When they took off their coats, when they broke off the palm trees, <laughs> And of course, the recognition was, here comes a man who should not be able to be doing what he's doing. If you had been around horses and donkeys, it's real easy to spot the difference between an older horse and a younger horse, an older donkey and a younger donkey. They recognized that young donkey. They recognized that that was the mother of the young donkey. They recognized that this prophecy here is exactly what they were seeing. And again, they began to cry, Hosanna, I save us through prayer. And it's the same thing, again, they would have done for a visiting king or queen or someone like that. And uh, unknowingly, on that faithful day, the 10th of Nisan, they had, as a nation, selected Jesus Christ to be the Lamb without squat without spot or blemish. They had selected him to be their perfect sacrifice that would come to pass four days later. It came to pass, remember we were talking earlier, sundown on Wednesday begins Thursday in Jewish ways of doing things. The 14th day of Nisan, when the sun came down, Jesus Christ went up to the upper room the disciples had gotten a lamb. Uh, they had sacrificed a lamb. Uh, they had fixed it up. The 12 of them that were actually 13 counting Jesus all partook of the lamb himself. And then, of course, Jesus went on with the Last Supper. He handed them the cup. He said, here, drink all of this. Uh, he handed them the bread. He said, this is the, my body that is broken for you. After that, there was some teaching that went on. 
some of the best teaching you'll ever find. Uh, it's in the book of John. After the foot washing, after what we call the Last Supper or Communion, uh, Jesus, there are several chapters there that some of the best teaching you'll ever read right there in the book of John. Uh, wonderful, wonderful things that he said and taught us there. But uh, he left, of course, went to the Garden of Olives, was taken, uh, arrested, brought down for trial, and before the sun was done, before it was all over with, on the 14th day of Nisan, that Thursday, Jesus Christ was crucified, and then shortly after sundown, uh, lay in the tomb, the brand new tomb that uh, had been prepared. No one had ever been in it before, but they took Jesus and put him in the tomb. He became our sacrifice. His blood was shed for us. And uh, he became the sacrifice that would never have to be done over again. Uh, his sacrifice, the sacrifice of the lamb in Egypt, uh, saved the Egyptians from the death angel that night. Thank God. Jesus Christ, sacrifice of blood. The devilish death angel has nothing to say for us if we have the shed blood of Jesus Christ on us. Today's lesson, to a large extent, has been a bit of a history lesson. And I didn't mean for it just to be a history lesson. I really wanted you to understand today that God is always working something. He's always doing something, making something ready for tomorrow, next week, next month, next year. He was making, on this Palm Sunday, he was making the sacrifice known, without a doubt. This 10th of Nisan, the Passover lamb was selected. And the 14th of Nisan, the true Passover lamb was sacrificed. He was doing that so that we would be able to look back and see how he connected this to the Israelis coming out of Egypt and how he protected and watched over them through the Red Sea. Forty years in the wilderness they wandered. Their shoes did not wear out. Their clothes did not wear holes in them. <clears throat> Forty years they wandered there and God took care of them. Nobody came out with a massive army and overtook them and brought them and stole from them or anything like that. They grew strong in the 40 years that they were in the desert. When it came time to go across the Jordan River and march up to Jericho, 600,000 soldiers walked around Jericho every day for six days. And on the seventh day, they walked around it several times. And people have asked, how do you suppose God caused that wall to fall down there in Jericho? Well, if you had 600,000 people walking around your house <laughs> all week long, I got to say, that's why that wall might fall down too. But uh, see, God, He's always got something going. Uh, he didn't call me up this morning and tell me what His plan is for tomorrow. But I have faith and trust. I know, Sister Adrian, that God has got something going for tomorrow. He's got something going for next week. He's got something going for next month. And today's lesson on the Palm Sunday just proves that he had something going on Palm Sunday that they would find that come Thursday when Jesus Christ was crucified. The crucifixion had to be, you cannot rise from the dead unless you die first. I wish the crucifixion had not been so mean-spirited so hard on Jesus Christ. But let me tell you, folks, I am so glad. Take a look at the sign that you leave today. It tells you the tomb is empty. It is totally empty. There is nobody there. Uh, Brother Arthur Gordon was a good friend of mine. Went to Israel several times on trips. Came back. And if you ask him about his trip to Israel, no matter how you ask him and where he went, he would work it down to the tomb. And he would tell you, I went inside, it's empty. 
That was the most important thing for him to do. We went to see the tomb. It was empty, and he came back and told everything. Now, let me tell you that the tomb's empty. Thank God. Let's all stand this morning. Sister Rosie's not here to play off the piano. And uh, Sister Sandy's not here to sing just as I am. Sister Linda is, though. <coughs> and uh, we're going to ask Sister Linda just uh, just one verse to be mine, A.D. Uh, just as I am. Being the word or the song that we use here on Sunday morning. Just in case someone has a need for prayer, I would love to have the privilege of praying with you. As Sister Linda sings, is there one today? Just as I am. Is there one today that would say, Brother Black, I need prayer? Would you take me by the hand, Brother Black, and pray with me? Thank you, Sister Mary. Anybody have anything you'd like to share with us this morning? Just before we call this missile. If not, for those of you who can, would you stand your feet for the blessing? May the Lord bless thee and keep thee. May the Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Brother Gary, would you dismiss this assembly of word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this opportunity to come together and learn about your word, Father. Father, we pray that you'll give us traveling mercies as we travel home. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.